Enjoy that. Say amen. 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 Thank you, ladies. Beautiful, beautiful singing. Take your Bibles, please, to turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number 20, if you would, 21. That is chapter 21. And uh, while you're turning there, let me just mention a couple of things way of update. Reformers Unanimous this week had 78 on Friday night. We had four new folks there, 49 uh, total in the men and women's jail services. That's the Reformers Unanimous services, that is, and 28 uh, total in the workhouse. And so we're grateful for the avenue we have to go into the jails with this um, ministry and then also the jail ministry is separate from that. I don't have the numbers for that tonight, but we're thankful and grateful for what the Lord is doing there. Brother Zuniga helps us uh, with uh, the jail ministry and Brother Terry Walker with RU. And uh, Brother Zuniga will give a full report next week uh, regarding the uh, mission they had down in Texas. One night, they had nearly 2,000 folks show up. I think they had 152 saved. as a tremendous meeting. <clears throat> He'll be telling you more about that. And uh, <clears throat> while we're getting ready to go tonight, I want to uh, just uh, show you something that I found uh, in the, uh, little, the little uh, Southwest Airline magazine. It was in the back pocket, the seat back pocket there. And while I was waiting to take off, and you've got to turn your cell phones off, I flipped through that every now and then. And I was flipping through, and I saw this, this ad from Northrop Grumman, I think you uh, pronounce it that way. And uh, I saw that little uh, rock there. And Northrop Grumman does uh, uh, aerospace technology for our military and other, and other things. And I thought, well, that's a pebble. They said that's a microchip there. If you see there on the, uh, on the left, that is a microchip. And that's actually on a person's index finger. And I thought... And I got to reading that is not a pebble. That is a grain of sand. When I saw that, I thought, okay. So uh, and you say, why are you showing us that, preacher? Well, I thought it was pretty neat to show you, first of all. But secondly, I don't know uh, how the Antichrist is going to get that mark on your forehead and, or on your forearm. And he may not do any of that. He just might put a barcode on it like they scan at Kroger's. I don't know. Let me run you through somewhere just just beep, beep. Anyway, if you're beeping because what Antichrist put on your forearm and forehead, you're in a whole lot of trouble. But um, I thought if they can make a microchip that small, then uh, they can do anything. So anyway, take it down. Just I'll show you that. That has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> How many think that was interesting to me? Some of you, thank you. I thought, boy, I lost air. That's for sure. Let's stand together, please, read God's Word. And uh, we're in the series on the Apocalypse, chapter 21. And uh, it's going to get better here. When I was growing up in West Virginia, we used to have this guy. He would uh, advertise in the local paper about uh, he'd study the Revelation. He had this faraway look. He was a preacher, had these big old, big old glasses on, you know. And he always had his hat cocked down, this, this old man's hat cocked down. His name was Armordale, whatever. I forget his last name. But anyhow, he, uh, he would travel around from church to church and do the Revelation. So... So uh, today I'm going over my notes. My wife says, well, where's Armadale at today in his notes? <laughs> I'm not Armadale. Anyway, we're going to study the book of Revelation tonight. Verse number 1, chapter 21. And uh, let's uh, look at verse 1. Let's read this together. We're actually going to look at the whole chapter tonight. And we'll take them verse by verse in just a while. But verse number 1, let's read that together. Verse 1, ready? And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. I'll read now. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. I'm speaking tonight on a wonderful subject that is a subject of heaven. <laughs> Praise God, we got through all that stuff, the Great Tribulation, the Battle of Armageddon, uh, Satan now is cast into hell, the lake of fire, which burns forever and ever, the beast and the false prophets there, and now you and I are in heaven. Somebody say amen right there. Let's pray. Father, bless now, please, the reading of your word, and I pray you'll challenge us, Lord, tonight with the, this great truth that we're headed for heaven, and help us to be ready, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated the singing tonight was a little bit like heaven, and I enjoyed that. The choir song especially addressed heaven. How many believe there's a place called heaven, amen? And uh, it's up there, little streets of gold, gates of pearl. Uh, there are actually uh, people there. Jesus is there in his body. How many believe in the body resurrection? And he's not falling through the clouds. So there must be a real place called heaven. It's not a figment of our imagination. 
There was a time when God walked with man in the beautiful Garden of Eden. We read about it in Genesis. There was no sin. There was no sickness. Eden was the most beautiful place that you could ever imagine. Satan fell from heaven, tempted man to sin. This world has been plunged into a curse that has affected every generation. It is affecting us, the curse of sin. Since the beginning of time, man has been trying to find what some call heaven on earth. And man felt as though he almost accomplished that uh, with the building of the Tower of Babel. Uh, but that was a failure. And uh, then uh, the search continued throughout history. It, it's not always been attempted in a rebellious way like they did there at Babel. But, uh, for instance, the Israelites tried to keep their nation a place where God was worshipped. When they finally got to the promised land, uh, there was a desire to make it a little bit like heaven. And uh, the Hebrew writer says this in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10. Let me read this to you. Don't turn there. The Bible says, and this is our New Testament, or the Old Testament patriarchs. They, uh, says, uh, the New Testament writer says this about them. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they, de they desire a better country. This is speaking of Old Testament saints. Now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Ladies and gentlemen, God has prepared a place for us to go. And I'm looking for that place. I fully believe that our, our forefathers in America desired to make our nation as much like heaven as they could. And as soon as the first ships began to land on the shores of this great nation, they bound themselves together with the words of the Mayflower Compact. Let me read some of those words right here. They said this, and I quote, Now these are our founding fathers, which, by the way, our nation has all but walked away from uh, the purpose of this nation. One of the first documents said this, in the name of God. That was the first statement. In the name of God, amen. They must have been uh, good Christians, amen. In the name of God, amen. That, by the way, amen is a Bible word. You use it freely. Uh, we whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and advancements of the Christian faith in honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves <clears throat> together in a civil body politic for, the better, for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends of aforesaid, speaking of the furtherance of the gospel, and by virtue here, hereof uh, to an act, constitute, frame, such as equal laws, ordinance, acts, constitutions, offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony under which we promise all due submission and obedience. These first citizens of America, 41 Christian men, signed that document. They bound themselves together the, uh, the, the document says, in Christian faith, their desire was to flee, flee the reign of Bloody Mary that was killing Christians there in the old world and come to a place where they could worship God in freedom. And they signed it, uh, trusting God that they would have uh, what, what some thought would be heaven on earth. And the reason why is uh, they understood this world was not their home. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pilgrims. You're just a passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Amen. And the best that we can ever do is what has been done in the past because the devil is continually chipping away at any moral society and order uh, and uh, his, his desire to have his own world government and his own world power. And right now, you and I are living in the days that he understands he has a very short time. Someone said the other day, a preacher, why is it that it seems like that evil is ramping up. I'm going to tell you why it's ramping up. Because the devil is ramping up for his final run. I mean, it's a jungle out there. 
Uh, by the time we get to, to what John writes about in chapter 20, the devil's day has come and gone. John sees all of this in a vision. Now it's time uh, for, uh, for, for what uh, Jesus talked about to his disciples when he said this in John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. How many of you is coming again? And receive unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Ladies and gentlemen, understand this. This world's not our home. The Bible teaches this. The ultimate goal for all of us is what Jesus said, that where I am, there you may be also. Precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. You say, why? Because that is where Jesus wants us. That should be where we want to be someday. Now, there's several things I'll just throw up just by way of, uh, of uh, points tonight, general points. But I want to I talk about this tonight. First of all, as we read through the first eight verses, we see, number one, a total transformation of the universe. I'm going to show you what's coming up, a total transformation of the universe. Now, understand that in the vision that the Apostle John saw there on the Isle of Patmos, he was caught up and able to see some things that you and I, uh, didn't, wouldn't know anything about it if John hadn't wrote about them. But in the first few chapters, he talks about the churches and church age, types of churches in the last days. And then in chapter 4, he hears a trumpet, and he's caught up in the glory. We believe that's a picture of the rapture. So by the time we get to all the a blood run horse bridle deep through the streets of Jerusalem and all the battle of Armageddon and all that stuff that goes on, where much of the world is destroyed and people killed, you and I will be in heaven looking down at somebody say, man, right there. But now the millennial reign has come and gone, and now heaven or eternity is being ushered in. And we see here a total transformation of the universe. Verse number 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. By the way, Jesus said this in Matthew 24. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God uh, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now look at the verse 4. Look at this. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Amen. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life. What's that next word? Freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God. He shall be my son. But... The fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, understand all of these verses are preaching ground. I'm going to give you an overview here of heaven. We see, first of all, that the earth and heavens are not completely destroyed, but they are transformed. They're made new. Peter wrote about this in 2 Peter chapter 3. Turn back just a few pages there. In your Bible, we studied this uh, a few years ago as we went through these books. But look at the second, or second Peter, chapter number 3, verse number 11. Turn there if you would, and we'll read this. Here's what Peter said, one of the apostles, about this very act that you and I are reading about in John's Revelation. Second Peter, chapter 3, verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye be? In, uh, or look, look, skip out, I missed one. Look at verse number 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away, and a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth which dwelleth righteous. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in peace without spot and blameless. Peter was telling the folks that he was preaching to there, there's going to come a day when there's a new heaven and a new, it's all going to be made new again. 
when this transformation is complete, the Bible says there's no more sea. Most believe that means there's no oceans. And understand the time of the writing uh, of John. He was exiled in the Isle of Patmos and uh, separated from his church, <laughs> which was across the Aegean Sea. Uh, my wife and I had a chance to travel there a few years ago and, and to see all of that area there. And for John, the sea was a painful barrier for him. It was a wall of isolation from fellowship with his beloved flock of God there in his church. And uh, to the ancient people, the sea was a frightful and fearsome thing. It was a, often uh, uh, considered a, uh, just an awesome monster in, a, in a, uh, a watery grave. And they had no compass to guide them at sea. In the open sea on a cloudy day, their ships would be absolutely lost without the stars or sun. And so understand that uh, whenever uh, a, a, a shipmaster would take his cargo and his sailors out to sea, they would have no calculations of what could happen. They didn't, they didn't have the weather channel, amen. They would have no idea. So the sea represented this vast barrier, not just uh, for human beings, but for nations and continents. For years it was like that. And the sea was a great separator of mankind on the globe. But the Bible says God's going to uh, renovate the whole world as we know it, and that's all going to be gone. And uh, then we see the holy city of Jerusalem is now coming down out of heaven. During the millennial uh, t uh, kingdom, Jerusalem is on earth. In Israel has always been, and Jesus has been ruling there on the throne of David for a thousand years, just like he promised in the Old Testament. But now it's descending out of heaven to earth. Now, I don't know how to explain all this, and I read about stuff. You probably got your idea. I got my idea. But uh, some of the writers said that some believe that this new heaven kind of hovers over earth. We'll describe it in just a while. And that God's people may travel back and forth uh, from the new heaven and the new earth. With ease, you say, you mean we're going to have George Jetson backpacks on? No, I don't know what we're going to have on. I know one thing, we won't be running around on the hoverboard. Those things catch on fire. I got on the elevator just the other day. The fellow had a hoverboard, and I said, is that a hoverboard? He said, yeah, man, that's a hoverboard. I said, cool. Uh, I wanted to say, uh, is it going to catch on fire while we're on this elevator? But anyhow, it had nothing to do with nothing. But I saw a guy taking off on one of those jet packs the other day. I thought, that looks cool right there. I don't know what we're going to have. But I, I just know we're going to move around in the new heaven, new earth with ease. Verse 3 says this. I like this. The Bible says that, uh, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Watch this now. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Watch this now. Underline this. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. That little phrase where God tabernacles with men means that God himself shall be with us. I understand my Bible that no man has seen God at any time and live, but there's going to come a time that you and I are going to see God. And what a wonderful time that's going to be. And uh, so the Bible teaches us here that uh, uh, God will wipe away all of our tears. No more sorrow, no more pain. The former things are passed away. And understand that we'll have no need for the jails, have no need for funerals, have no need of anything. Can you imagine? This is like it was in Eden. I mean, no sickness, no pain, no death. It's all, the, the curse is all gone. The former things passed away. Everything is made new. Heaven has, you might say, that new car smell. My wife and I finally bought a, a, a car here about two years ago. And, uh, uh, I, 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 you know, I don't think I'd ever have to buy a new car if I could always keep it smelling like that new car smell. I remember years ago I bought one of those little things you hang on your mirror. It's called new car smell. It didn't smell like a new car. It smelled like a pine tree. Then I got something you squirt in your car. I said, new car smell. That didn't smell like a new car. It smelled like coconut. I mean, there's nothing like, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Nothing like a new car smell. If we could just find something to squirt in our cars, it smells brand new. You know what? I, I have never, if I clean that car, I wipe it down with a dust cloth with nothing on it. I, I try to clean it without anything that smells different. And, and you can get in that car and it still smells new. Praise God. I like that. I hope it lasts a long time. Save me a lot of money. You ever walk in a brand new house, one that doesn't smell like mildew and mothballs? <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but anyway. You ever walk in a brand new house that just smells like new paint, new carpet, and all that? Some of you say, yeah, I've done that. I've got allergies. But nevertheless, well, I have no allergies in heaven. <laughs> so you yeah, chew to that anyway. But uh, it's all going to be made new. Verses 6 through 8, there's another invitation to unbelievers in the church age is given here. And the Bible teaches us that salvation is free. It teaches our inheritance as our reward in verse 7. Uh, one man said years ago during the...
great uh, Chicago fire in 1871. D.L. Moody had the big church up there. And uh, uh, D.L. Moody's house burned down. As Mr. Moody was surveying the ruins of his house, a friend said, he said, Mr. Moody, I heard you lost everything. Well, said Moody, he said, you understand wrong. I've got a good deal more left than I lost. And his friend said, what do you mean? He said, you're not a rich man. That's when Moody replied uh, by having his Bible open, read to him, Revelation 21, 7, he who overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Ladies and gentlemen, if you lose everything here on planet Earth, you've got a God in heaven going to give it all back to you, and a whole lot more. Hell is the payment for the unsaved in verse number 8. We'll not go through all of that, but what a terrible place that will be. Ladies and gentlemen, before we leave this point of this new transformation of the universe, understand you need to make sure you got your ticket bought right now. Jesus Christ bought and paid for that ticket. Only you got to get it, get it punched. There ought to be a day that you can look back and say, this was the day that I prayed and trusted Christ as Savior. May 30th, 1965. One of our young girls just got saved the other day, and she said, Preacher, I remember every bit of it, but I don't remember the date. It's okay if you don't remember the date. Do you remember the time that you prayed to receive Jesus Christ? Not have another chance. We see number two, not just a total transformation of the universe, but a thrilling description of heaven. Verses 9 through 21, a thrilling description of heaven. Let's read this together. I'm not going to elaborate all of it. Don't have time. There came unto me one of the seven angels who had the seven vials, those bowls that were dumped out. So here's one of the seven that dumped out those terrible vials of destruction. One comes to where John is at. The Bible says, and he talked with me, saying, Come up hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Speaking of the church, I'm going to show you all about it, where she's at, where she's living at. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was likened to a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. By the way, all of these have something in particular. There went the old pot right there. All of these uh, particular stones have some meaning in particular, and I'm not going to elaborate on all of those tonight. But uh, we see this thrilling description continues. And uh, having the glory of God, her light was like the stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high and 12 gates, and uh, at the, the gate 12 angels. A name was written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of, of Israel. On the east uh, three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations in them, uh, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he talked with me and had a golden reed to measure the city, the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And by the way, this reed, speaking of a long stick, sometimes when I was a little boy and, and my grandpa wanted to measure something, he'd go out and he'd uh, take his knife and he would, he would cut off some type of stick, measure potatoes or, or whatever, some type of measuring stick. And this one he had a reed. Here's the size of the reed. And verse 16, and the city lies four square, and the length of the lar is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. And the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. That's very important. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, uh, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. Uh, and the building of the wall of it was as jasper, and the city was pure gold, like in a clear glass. And by the way, we have never seen perfectly pure gold on planet earth but you'll see pure gold like into clear glass and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones the found first foundation was jasper second sapphire third chalcedony fourth emerald fifth is sardonyx and sixth is sardius and seventh is chrysolite and, and eighth the beryl and the ninth the topaz and tenth were the chrysoprasus and the eleventh the janseth and twelfth was amethyst and, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls every gate as one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold as it were transparent glass by the way you saw that one pearl gate one pearl uh, big oyster there amen and uh, don't that god will do it and i saw no temple there on, therein for the lord god almighty and the lamb are the temple of it and uh, here is a thrilling description of heaven uh years ago there was a young African student that had come to America and he had studied uh, in a, uh, a seminary and uh, he had traveled around to many, many churches uh, in America 
And he went to preach one of his first sermon, and he wanted to preach it on heaven. He said this, and I quote, I've seen the great wealth of that is here in the United States, the fine homes and cars and clothes. I've listened to many sermons in churches here as well, but I've yet to hear one sermon about heaven because everyone here has so much in this country, no one preaches about heaven. People here don't seem to need it. In my country, most people have very little. So we preach on heaven all the time because we need heaven very, very much. Somebody say man right there. We are spoiled in America. It is true that we have a lot. We have a lot because we have been in the past blessed of God. But don't let any of that take away your zeal and your desire to go to heaven someday. It is a city four square. Some believe that means it is cubed. Most believe the measurement of 12,000 furlongs is approximately 1,500 miles. I want you to get the picture. Uh, this would extend uh, from the northern tip of Maine to the southern tip of Florida and from Virginia Beach on the east coast all the way across America to Colorado. But remember, someone says, well, that's not very big. Remember, it's 1,500 miles high. It's cubed. Let's give it one mile. One mile is pretty far away up to look. And uh, uh, when you fly uh, that, that high in the sky, that is. And uh, if, uh, if, uh, it is 15, if, if it is one mile high, 1,500 miles high, uh, that means that uh, there will be 1,500 spaces the size that I just described. So let's say that I just described three-fourths of America. There will be 1,500 of those. You get the picture here? I think we'll all fit in there. Won't be any trouble then. And that is just the new heaven, not counting the new earth. You're starting to get the picture. I'm just saying this section describes in heavenly details a beautiful heaven someday. And the apostle said this, I hath not seen, neither ear heard, neither has entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. How many say, I love him? I remember years ago, my wife and I had the privilege to take a cruise, our first cruise. We've never done anything like that before. And we cruised down in the islands of the Caribbean. I used to remember this really, really well. I think it was St. Martin. I believe that's what it was. We had cruised for about a day and a half. And uh, we were on this ship. And, uh, and the ship was very, very smooth and calm. And they told us that they were going to dock uh, about 6 o'clock, about daybreak, was daybreak we would be in the port at St. Martin there. And uh, now you have to understand, I was raised in West Virginia, moved to Tennessee, I loaded up the truck and I moved to Tennessee. And so we had not been a whole lot of places. And so we get in this cruise, first one. And uh, so uh, we're there. And, and, and early that morning, I felt that, I felt that boat bump. I never felt anything at that point. And I told my wife, I said, uh, I used to run a harbor boat years ago when I worked for the power company. And I felt that bump, and I felt that bump before. I, I said, I believe we've hit the dock. And I said, well, let's wait. It's almost daylight. We had a big old window there, a deck. I said, uh, let's wait for just a few minutes till it be daylight. And uh, we waited, and we see the daylight peeking through the curtains. And we walked up to that curtain. We threw that thing back. We saw that, we saw that coral blue harbor that beautiful bay with all the sailboats on it, it literally took our breath away. Some of you looking at me like, well, that ain't nothing. You know, you've been to Hawaii and Barbados and everywhere, St. Lucia and all that, and uh, Russia. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I know you've probably seen a whole lot more than I have, but, but I have seen a lot more since then. But at that point, I've never seen anything like it. I remember just out of our mouths, both of us, almost the same time, we thought if that's that beautiful, what in the world is heaven going to be like? Heaven's a beautiful place. Number three, write this one down. Number three, we see a triumphant congregation. Verse 22, a triumphant congregation. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are of the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, than to shine in it. The glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb uh, is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at, not, at, at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations uh, into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination 
or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. How many glad your name's written in the Lamb's book of life? All right, you're going to be there. We see here a triumphant congregation in heaven. No need for a church in heaven. There's no temple there. You say, why? <laughs> because God's there and Jesus is there. Well, have plenty of time to worship them. But the beautiful thing is this. By the way, I'm an independent, fundamental Baptist. But when we get to heaven, there will be no denominational tags. And I don't want to shock you. But we're not the only ones going. Those who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and they have prayed and put their trust in Jesus Christ, they're going to heaven. And you and I are in that number. Praise God for that. No need for the Son there, the Lord, and, and uh, God lighted up. No more nationality lines. All nations become one there in heaven. <laughs> Funny, this past week, our Secretary of State, John Kerry, was making a speech uh, at the Northwestern University. And he got up and he said, uh, I, I know what he was making fun of, but he said, there, we don't need any walls in America. He made this statement. He said this. He said, you, you're about to graduate into a complex and borderless world. There's two thoughts behind that. We are quasi-borderless, I guess, because of the digital world. You can, you can go through the Internet anywhere you want to go, and that's true. But we still have borders, and we still have borders for a reason. Good fences make good neighbors. I learned that back in the mountains. Little did Kerry know that he was making a prophetical statement because you and I, well, I'll tell you this right now, once the borders and nations come down in this world, and they will to a certain extent under Antichrist, it won't be heaven, it will be chaos. But it is prophetic on the fact that there will come a day that there will be no borders. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. God's going to nuke this thing and burn it up. I shouldn't say nuke it. I don't know how he's going to do it. But he's going to make all things new. <clears throat> no more national borders. Gates remain open because there is no danger here. <clears throat> no night there. No more darkness. Remember, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But won't be so in heaven. And uh, <clears throat> this is limited to only, <clears throat> only those whose names are written in the book of life. Number four. Let me pop us over into chapter 22 for just five verses. Look at this. And he saw, and he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was there a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit uh, every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there should be no more curse. Amen. That's why your hair is falling out. That's why you're sick. That's why you do bad things. But the throne of God and of, of the Lamb of Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. Shall I underline that? And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there, no, neither need of a candle, nor a light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth him light. And they shall reign forever and ever. What a wonderful place it's going to be. Number four, here's the last thought. We see a tender atmosphere in heaven. God just got this beautiful, tender, lush place. A pure crystal river is there. And it's called the river of life. I want you to think about this. Our water right now. I think we got pretty good water here in Murfreesboro. But I'll tell you what. Uh, we're struggling even just getting pure water today. We don't have a clue. We don't have a clue what's in our water. In fact, they've got to do so much to our water. It's a wonder we don't all glow in the dark. When we get to heaven, pure water there. And water is a, is a sign of peace and tranquility. The tree of life is there with its 12 fruits yielded monthly. I'm not sure. One month it's this fruit. One month it's this fruit. One, but it's for the healing of the nations. I have this written down. We'll still enjoy eating in our new bodies. <laughs> what would heaven be like if you couldn't have a hot dog with chili and slaw anyway, huh? On onions. Well, we won't worry about those onions in heaven. Amen. Now, this is interesting. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were forbidden to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 3.17. Forbidden to eat. They did. They sinned. 
God drove them from the Garden of Eden, even though He showed them grace and mercy and He killed the animal. The blood of that animal represented Jesus Christ, gave them the coats of skin to cover their nakedness. But God still drove them from the garden. There's an interesting verse found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24 that tells us that He stationed two angels at the eastern gate of Eden to keep them from coming back in the garden. And the purpose for that was to keep them from eating of the tree of life. And uh, most believe that this was to keep them from living forever if they ate that tree of life, to keep them from living forever in their sinful state. Could you imagine what that would have been like? God had a plan, and God never wants mankind to circumvent that plan, and they continually try to do that. Now, here, a new day is coming where the saints of God will be in the very presence of God again, and we'll be able to eat of that tree of life freely. Amen. Some of you are saying, I don't want to go to heaven and eat fruit. Pro I promise you, you're going to like it. I don't know if it's going to be an apple or a tangerine or a pear or a plum or a kumquat or whatever. I don't know what it'll be. It might be something that's round that tastes like a hot dog. I don't know. But it'll be good, I promise you that. The Bible says in verse number 3, no more curse. I have praise God written down right there. Uh, 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 this was placed on mankind of Eden and uh, uh, the case that sin uh, brought against us. And then uh, we understand here that that curse is completely obliterated. It's all gone. You and I have no understanding of what it would be to live, like without, live life without the curse on us. I get up every morning in my life with rheumatoid arthritis and I just always thank God when the first foot hits the ground and the other foot hits the ground, I'm thankful the Lord even more that I can stand up. And then by the time I go to the mirror and look in the mirror, I'm thinking, bud, you need something. And I thank God for coffee. It halfway gets the job done. I'm just saying, you and I are going to have these new bodies and the curse is all gone. What a wonderful day that's going to be. We see the face of God and we reign forever and ever. No more darkness. The order I get, everything seems to be closing in on me. I know you old folks say when I say stuff like that, you say, you don't know half of it. Well, I know one thing. I can get every light on the house on, and I still can't hardly read anything. One of these days, we won't need a candle. We won't need a night light. I've got night lights everywhere. I, can't, I get up in the middle of the night, and once my eyes get adjusted to the darkness, I don't want to turn all the lights on because I don't want to have to try work hard to get back to sleep. Now, my wife, when she gets out in the middle of the night, she just, boom, she just turns her all on. But I, I got these little night lights around, you know. To, I don't have that. That just any of you scared of the dark? You don't have to worry about that. Amen. And we'll live forever and ever in that wonderful state. Now, this is what John was writing about when he wrote these lines in First John chapter three, verse two, beloved. Now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in Him purifieth himself, even as He, Jesus, is pure. What's He saying? He's saying, you and I are the sons of God right now. You can't be, if you're born again, you can't be any more saved than you are right now. Either saved or not saved. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, we haven't ever seen it. John writes about it in Revelation. We've not experienced it. We've not seen it. We've not enjoyed it. But when we see Him, we shall be like Him, pure and holy and in our glorious body. And He says, because of that, we should be purifying ourselves. Because of that... We should be like that old, those Old Testament saints who said we're just a pilgrim traveling down here on planet Earth. We are looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And because of that, if we believe that, you and I should be working ourselves every single day to become more like Jesus Christ. You know what I'm seeing today? I'm seeing the opposite of that. Some Christians, instead of getting closer to Jesus, they seem to be getting farther away. You say, preacher, how do you get that? Well, 
Our churches should be full right now. This should be a time of purging for the church. We look at all the politics. We look at all the new things that are coming on the scene. I mean, just it's just like drinking out of the fire hose in the world right now. We step back and say, my, my, it's getting bad. It's getting bad. It's getting, well, what are you going to do? Go up on the side of a hill, put on some kind of white robe, and wait for God to beam you up? No, sir. You and I are taught to get our lives right with God. He's given us time to see revival. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what I'm praying for, that we have an old-fashioned revival where God's people got back in church, got their hearts right with God, got their Bible back down, started reading, started living like Jesus would have us live. He's coming again. We're to purify ourselves for this day. Now, I want to ask you tonight, are you ready for heaven? Are you saved? Are you living in some backslidden state away from God? Are you trying to cover up some kind of sin in your life you never covered up? Jesus sees it all. And I want to challenge you tonight. Let's get things right with God. Let's get things right with each other. Let's fix what needs fixing tonight. Because Jesus is coming again. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. How many believe this? For my father's house are many mansions. Now, if you read a funny version of the Bible, it says in there that there'll be many rooms in heaven. I don't know nothing about any rooms. Somebody said, well, heaven, the way it's, the way it's shaped, there won't be enough room for all the mansions. I just described for you 1,500 layers of possibility. Now, I don't know if it's going to be like that. I'm just trying to give you some mental description. There might not be nothing underneath you. Your mansion, mansion might be hanging out there. I don't know what it's going to be. I'm just saying there's going to be plenty of room for a mansion. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and that's just what we read about. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Do you want to be in heaven? That where I am, there you may be also. Folks, we're getting too comfortable with the world. The Old Testament saints got sick of the world. And the New Testament saints in John's day, because of the persecution, got real tired of the world. And I don't know what's going to happen before Jesus Christ comes back. I know this. I'm not going through the tribulation period. I know that. But I dare say there's some Christians right now over in the Middle East that's sick of the world. They're ready for Jesus to come back. There's Christians in a whole lot of places in this world that have no reason to stay here. Let's don't put God in a position where we have to lose it all to want to go to heaven. Let's stand together, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I appreciate your attention tonight. I want everybody to be ready for heaven. Everybody to be ready for heaven. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and no one's looking around. Let me just ask you this question. And I know you hear me say this three times a week, and I'll be saying it until we all go to heaven or I die. I wonder who would say this, preacher. I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I got it all pinned down. Would you hold your hand up? Put it real high. I'm saved. I know I'm saved. God bless you. What a beautiful sight. Many hands raised. Thank you. Put your hands down. Now, let's just be honest. Let's be sincere tonight, this evening. If you could not raise your hand, thank you for being honest. But tonight, why wait any longer? Why wait any longer? And I'm going to ask you to do something just a moment. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm just going to say this tonight. If you're not sure that heaven's your home, we would have a man stand on each aisle with a Bible in their hand. In just a moment, they'll take that Bible. And they'll show you tonight in just a few moments how you could be a born-again Christian. If you're a man, a man will talk with you. If you're a lady, a lady will talk with you. They'll give you a lady. Just come down and get it right. Settle it. If Jesus Christ would come back tonight, we come back in the middle of the night. As a born-again Christian, are you ready 
to meet him. If you're not ready to meet him, if something's standing between you and the Lord, would you be willing to fix it tonight? Father, this evening, we thank you for the message on heaven. We believe we're going there soon. And I pray tonight you work in the hearts of those who could not raise their hand just a moment ago. Help them to come and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. They'll find a friend down front. They'll find somebody that will pray with them and work with them and show them right from the Scriptures what they need to do. And I pray that you'll help them to step out and trust you as Savior tonight. Lord, we as Christians, Lord, as I was just rehearsing that, reading about heaven, as we heard heaven sung about tonight in the beautiful music, Lord, in my heart, I want to love heaven more than I love planet Earth. And I want to thank you for making this place for us. Not just eternity, we're living forever, but in a place like this. Help us as Christians. Maybe somebody just needs to come and say, thank you for heaven, Lord. Thank you for salvation. Bless this altar call, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Here it is, folks, tonight. Well,